This week, how will the world's biggest polluter wean itself off of fossil fuels? We map out China's journey to net zero with one of the country's leading environmentalists. We did see some uh, great progress made in, uh, in terms of local pollution control. Protecting the Great Green Wall. A forest holding back the spread of the Gobi Desert is in danger of being cut down and creating a schism between China's central and local governments. There's sort of a balance that they're trying to win. Is there's a climate diplomacy on one side, while on the other side, they very clearly have some economic goals and needs. And the dark side of clean energy. A crucial component of solar panels is being produced in secretive factories in Xinjiang. Our reporters went to find out what was inside. Any company that's active in Xinjiang is cooperating with the regime there. So it's impossible to have a clear conscience. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green. As the world's biggest emitter of carbon dioxide, China holds the fate of the planet's climate in its hands. Beijing has set itself an ambitious carbon-neutral target, but that self-imposed deadline will need to be hit well in advance if the world is to avoid further climate catastrophe. Tom McKenzie explains how China plans to hit the target. China, the world's second largest economy and the biggest emitter of carbon dioxide, has set itself an ambitious target of being carbon neutral by 2060. The country's emissions are expected to peak in 2030. If it meets its carbon neutral target by 2060, it would be the fastest of the major economy has gone from peak to neutral. But there's a problem. Climate scientists say emissions need to hit net zero by 2050 to keep warming at or close to the threshold of one and a half degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So could China pull its target forward? Beijing may have set the 2060 goal to give itself a buffer. Setting conservative targets that it meets ahead of time is part of China's playbook. Beijing also points to the ambition of its 2060 target. It's aiming to be neutral on all greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide. And inroads are already being made. China opened the world's largest carbon trading market in July, creating a framework for how carbon emissions are priced and regulated. Local authorities have been told to develop regional plans to curb emissions. Heavy polluting steel is being squeezed. Production plunged in July to a 15-month low as output was reduced to curb emissions. Coal production fell to its lowest in four months in July as environmental curbs kicked in. Meanwhile, wind, solar and nuclear energy saw double-digit gains. But Beijing will need to weigh the shift to renewables with the social impact. The coal and processing industries alone employ 3.5 million people. And then there's the price tag. Goldman Sachs estimates the 2060 goal will require $1.5 trillion in new tech investment. BNEF puts the entire cost of overhauling the economy at close to $8 trillion. The EU is facing a $630 billion price tag towards its net zero goal by 2050. And the US is looking at $2.5 trillion over the next decade. Regardless of the monetary toll, what's clear is that the environmental costs of Beijing's hedging will be much greater. The world's ability to avert an even more severe climate crisis is likely to hinge on China hitting neutral well before 2060. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie there with a look at China's ambitious climate targets. But just how practical is that goal? Joining me now from Beijing is one of China's leading environmentalists, Ma Jun. He's the director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs. So great to talk to you today, sir. Of course, IPE was established in 2006. How much progress have you seen from then to now? Yeah, from then to now, we did see some uh, great progress made in, uh, in terms of local pollution control. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to water pollution, we have seen the water quality level, you know, the, 
the Black and Snally River uh, percentage have dropped from nearly 28% to less than 1% last year, you know, from 20, 2006 to now. And on the air quality side, you know, we started monitoring uh, PM 2.5 and ozone from 2013. And from then to now, you know, Beijing's PM 2.5 uh, concentration have dropped from 89 to 38 last year. So IPE has a live pollution map that you say has been attributable to some changes in behavior. Can you just talk about how the accessibility and the transparency of that data makes a difference? For a long time, you know, China has uh, copied the uh, uh, emission standards and laws from the uh, Western world, but the enforcement uh, 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 remained to be to be weak. Uh, so the cost of violations for a long time have been uh, much lower than the cost of compliance. So the okay. companies have no incentives to clean up. Those major emitters have been pushed to make online monitoring data real time available, meaning every hour or every two hours, those major emitters have to give their data to the public. And we put that into a mobile app called the Blue Map. And through this process, some of the largest emitters in China have been made to clean up. So clearly, June, progress is being made, but there's still a lot of progress yet to be made. And of course, the Chinese government has set a goal of peak emissions before 2030 and then carbon neutrality by 2060. Should China be looking to reach that faster? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the global climate situation uh, is really pressing. And this year, you know, China uh, also have suffered uh, from the extreme weather, you know, the, uh, the record level of, uh, of, of, of extreme rainfall, and uh, which caused uh, flooding and uh, water logging. Hundreds of lives have been lost. And, uh, uh, and we're uh, experiencing the rising temperature, the rising sea level as well, along with others. So, so each of us have to, uh, to do it and to try to do it faster. So we know our global responsibility. So that's why this carbon pick and neutrality pledge have been made. Having said that, it will be very challenging because mm. we're gonna have the shortage, um, not just we have to uh, artificially uh, uh, push for a carbon pick, uh, uh, but also the time, time span between carbon pick and neutrality will be the shortest uh, mm. in, the, in the world. Yeah, so definitely a large challenge. So what do you, as the head of an environmental NGO, a very large one in China, what, is, what would you like to see the Chinese government and Xi Jinping put into place in order to reach those goals? First, we need to uh, basically distribute this, this national carbon ambition down to where the 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide were actually emitted. Uh, so we need to distribute the national ambition uh, down to the provinces and cities and then major industries and the carbon intensive uh, emitters. Ma Jun, director of the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs and one of China's leading environmentalists. Thank you so much. Coming up, a forest on the edge of the Gobi Desert is being cut down and causing a dispute between China's central leadership and local government. We'll investigate the loss of China's Great Green Wall next. This is Bloomberg Green. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja, and here's what's happening in green this week. Green funds sold by some of the world's biggest asset managers are failing to live up to the climate goals set out in the Paris Agreement. This according to a review of the industry conducted by Influence Map. It says that more than half of climate-themed funds flunked the test. Also in Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said his government will require Canada's oil and gas sector to reduce emissions if he's re-elected. The Liberals pledged to force energy 
energy companies to set targets to cut emissions with the aim of net zero by 2050. And finally, the U.S. wants more involvement from Japan and China in the global fight against climate change. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate John Kerry is in Asia to reinforce that message. Kerry met with Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga in Tokyo, and China has confirmed he'll also visit Tianjin. The visits take place ahead of the COP26 Climate Summit in Scotland. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja, and that's your Green Brief. Thanks, Jen. China's Great Green Wall is under threat. Yangguan Forest in Gansu Province was protected in the 1960s to prevent the spread of the Gobi Desert, but now it's the source of tension between the central government and local leaders after reports that it was being cut down. We sent our Alan Wan to investigate. Howdy, folks. I'm inside a taxi uh, on a lonely stretch of highway uh, along the, uh, the Gobi Desert. I'm on my way to the Yangguan Forest in Gansu Province. Basically, local officials there have been accused of illegally leasing land to local farmers and companies like Dunhuang Wine to cut down trees for commercial purposes, namely to build vineyards. We made a number of attempts to speak to Dunhuang Wine about these allegations, including visiting their offices in downtown Dunhuang and the Yangguan Forest Farm, which were both closed when we visited them. On the left, you see all these trees being chopped down for vineyards. And on my right are the trees that are still left standing. And uh, over here, uh, you've got uh, some trees that have been uprooted. Uh, the Yangguan Forest Park was established in the 1960s to counter the effects of desertification of this area. And a big chunk of that land had been given over to uh, the Dunhuang Wine Company. Uh, this, this company has been accused by uh, environmental groups of illegally cutting down trees in order to grow vineyards. An employee at Dunhuang Wine, who asked not to be named because it's a sensitive issue, said that when the company rented its land, many of the trees were already dead, adding that the poplars only lived for about 50 years and officials had failed to upgrade the forest with new trees. A notice on the board outside the farm's office says it took 50 years of hard work to grow a sand prevention screen stretching five kilometers in a desert like a green wall that safeguards the Dunhuang Oasis. Ken Bao Hua, the Deputy Director of Gansu Forestry and Grassland Administration, said the uh, Yangguan Forestry Farm has been replacing and improving degraded forests over the years, according to the rules, and it didn't find any trees cut to make space for planting grapes in its investigation. So one of the most interesting things about all this is that the, the central government is backing uh, claims of environmental groups that there's a lot of illegal de deforestation going on here. Uh, just, just goes to show that the central government is taking seriously environmental issues, ecological issues, coming at a time when, and not just Gansu, but the whole country is being hit by a wave of uh, sandstorms. Right now, it seems like the, the central government, in many ways, uh, which, which wants to protect the environment, prevent some of these sandstorms from becoming a, a regular occurrence, and it also wants to mean its, uh, you know, its green goals to uh, be uh, carbon neutral by 2060. So the government, so the government here has to try to seek a balance between what the local folks want, which are jobs, and, and what the central government wants, which is to protect the environment and to meet its uh, green goals. That was Alan Wan reporting from Yangguan Forest and Gansu. And while the Chinese government may be showing a willingness to protect that project, there are those that are skeptical that Beijing is taking its 2060 goal seriously. Taya Smith, Center for Strategic and International Studies Senior Associate for the Energy Security and Climate Change Program, recently said that, quote, there are very few indications that China is serious about lowering its emissions in the short term. Formerly the principal advisor to Secretary Hank Paulson on the U.S.-China relationship and a key force behind creating the two nations' strategic economic dialogue, she joins me now. So, Taya, let's just start with that 2060 goal. When China says, by 2060, we're going to be carbon neutral, can we really take that at face value? I think that you can take that they are going to work very hard to get there. 
I think that this is something that uh, the administration, Xi Jinping and others have decided will happen. The questions that we have is what does that mean in the meantime? So 2060 is a long, long way out. And it's very important to note that it is a full 10 years after the rest of the world is trying to reach a carbon neutral goal. So 2060 is pretty farther out. There is a more near term goal of peak emissions before 2030. Is that looking realistic? That one's looking a lot harder, quite honestly. Um, with the increase in coal and the focus um, this last year on having a lot of growth, increased demand for electricity, so there's increased dependency upon coal, it looks like it's going to be harder and harder to reach the 2030 goal. Now, I want to be clear, China has never missed a goal, right, that they've set on climate change. Uh, have things, the bigger question that we have is if they reach the 2030 peak emissions goal, how long will they stay at that peak before they ramp it down to reach a new net zero, zero goal. And of course, with China, there always is the goal of economic growth and growing the Chinese economy. Does that inherently run counter to improving climate policy? Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about how outspoken and what a leader China has been on the climate movement. Right. Ever since uh, following in Paris, they were quite the leader there. In comparison to the U.S., China really took off in terms of its focus diplomatically on climate change. Taya Smith, Center for Strategic and International Studies, Senior Associate for the Energy Security and Climate Change Program. Thank you so much. Coming up, allegations of human rights abuses and sanctions mar China's solar energy hub. Xinjiang produces almost half of the world's polysilicon, a key part of solar panels. But the U.S. government says forced labor is widespread in the region. Our reporters travel there. Up next, this is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. Well, China's green ambitions may have a darker side. Polysilicon is a vital ingredient in solar panels, making it key in the path to more renewable energy supply. But nearly half of the world's polysilicon is produced in Xinjiang, a region that critics say is the center of a crackdown on Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. Our reporters Colin Murphy and James Maker travel to Xinjiang to try to shed some light on what goes on in these factories. So yeah, they're definitely following us, so this could put an end to our video and photograph very quickly. So the security apparatus in Xinjiang was pretty intense. You know, before I went to Xinjiang, I was, uh, in my head, I was saying things like, well, you know, it's probably uh, exaggerated somewhat, but it was actually a little bit more. Those are two of the cars that have been following us for at least a couple of hours now. Factories like this one churn out vast quantities of polysilicon, the raw material in billions of solar panels all over the world. Solar panels are modules, and nearly all solar panels are made out of polysilicon. Essentially, almost any crystalline silicon module is likely to have a small amount or more of Xinjiang silicon in it. Very few are actually pure. Chinese companies dominate the solar industry and collectively control at least 60% of global capacity at every step in the supply chain. In Xinjiang alone, these four factories, Dacho New Energy, Shinta Energy, East Hope Group, and GCL Poly Energy are expected to produce nearly half the global polysilicon supply. In total, China is expected to produce over 80% of the world's polysilicon. The region attracts this industry mainly, I would say, because of electricity. Xinjiang has a lot of relatively cheap coal. Well, polysilicon is made using a lot of energy, so essentially cheap electricity means cheap polysilicon. Fueled by cheap polysilicon, solar capacity is set to grow by about a quarter this year. 2020 saw record installations backed by almost $150 billion in investment, bringing solar panels to energy farms and homes around the world. The problem is that this industrial boom is reliant on China's troubled Xinjiang region, and almost no one outside China knows what goes on inside the polysilicon factories. And consumers, companies and governments are growing uneasy about their reliance on the region, rife with alleged human rights abuses. Shinta Energy, East Hope Group and GCL Poly Energy Holdings 
have been linked to a state-run employment program that, according to some foreign governments and academics, may at times amount to forced labor. We welcome more foreign nationals to visit Xinjiang and see with their own eyes the achievements made there. We also call on media outlets that are committed to objective and unbiased reporting, as well as professional ethics, to tell the true story through their paper, pen, camera and microphone, which will expose the rumors and the lies about Xinjiang. Mm. We visited uh, four of the polysilicon plants over a period of two to three days. I'm getting the same ringtone, seems to be anyway. So. So we're just uh, leaving the factory and we, we have been in touch with them many times uh, to try to set up an interview. Uh, the company has uh, repeatedly said no or are delayed on our requests and most recently said that uh, the topic was very sensitive. So we came here today to see for ourselves and try to see if that would make a difference but the end result was that we were not able to conduct an interview. We're told, on the one hand, come visit, you know, we want journalists to come, but the reality is just so starkly different. The main place that we, we encountered workers was at Shinta. We just happened on the scene just around the time when they were changing shift, and uh, a small group, uh, two or three of those people, stopped to, to listen to, to what I had to say, uh, at which point they, they went almost on script and said, oh, we cannot speak to uh, reporters, you have to speak to the company, we're not allowed to speak on behalf of the company. They obviously had been uh, well trained by the company uh, to respond to this situation should somebody from the outside, whether it be a journalist or a diplomat, ask them questions about what's, what's going on in the factory. China says their initiatives train workers and send them to factories as part of an effort to help poor ethnic minorities find better employment. Gay Attempting to say no to a forced labor program, for example, might land someone right back in a camp or in some other kind of carceral setting. The market for solar power has surged as governments and companies around the world race to stop global warming. That means millions of homeowners buying solar panels everywhere face an awful trade-off. Embrace the green future and you're possibly purchasing the products of forced labor. There's little evidence that forced labour is involved in polysilicon manufacture in Xinjiang. That said, any company that's active in Xinjiang is cooperating with the regime there. So it's impossible to have a clear conscience. In March, the US, the European Union and Canada put new sanctions on China over alleged human rights abuses. The US has already banned imports of cotton and tomatoes. The substance needed for solar panels could be next. Bloomberg's Colin Murphy and James Maker there. The four companies didn't respond to multiple requests to see comment on that story. Well, that wraps it up for this week's edition, but you can keep the conversation going. Follow us on Twitter, at Climate. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green. Bloomberg.